Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Guaranteed to help your congregation grow in three weeks. Guaranteed to this conference, if you attend it, we'll bring people in and raise your offerings by 20, 30, even 40 percent. We have the secrets. These are emails that I actually often get in my email box. These are book covers. These are conferences, slogans that are out there encouraging churches to grow. And now, I don't think any of us have been blind to those. We've seen those around because they've been around since around 1965 when the church growth movement took off. We've heard all kinds of things in order to bring people into the church. You need to have a nicer, more gentler color. This, this drab gray, it, it, oh boy, we need to go with white. Or, or maybe a cream, right? Maybe a peach? No. Uh, and we've also heard that sometimes a way to encourage people to come is a little later time, right? Well, 9 o'clock's a bit early. We have to roll out of bed and oh, we have to get moving. So 11 o'clock, that's when people are awake. Oh, we've heard that one. We've, we've even tried that one, haven't we? Oh, well, how about another one? Changing the name of the church. Instead of Grace Lutheran Church, we should be called... Grace Community Church of Love and Grace and Mercy and all those people who are out there are welcome. It would be a little long for the sign, but we could get a lot of things underneath it. No, we've heard all these slogans. We've even tried some of these slogans, haven't we? We've tried to, the surefire ways that would bring people into our church. Three easy steps are we can fix a car dent, but why doesn't it seem we can fix a church growth in three easy steps? No, it's not just the Lutheran church that's tried this, is it? We see this all over the place. Different ideas, different surefire methods that are sure to grow the church, sure to bring people in, and sure to keep them coming. Except for one problem. They don't work, do they? Churches at times will see a boom in their, in their attendance. They may see a boom in the offering. But it doesn't work over the long run. Many of the churches that look back the pastors who look back at the numbers, they say to themselves, well, we had, we had other Christians, but no non-Christians came. So is that really church growth? Not really, because they simply is someone who's displeased with the music or the sermon or something else about the service, and they just move to another church. So not really growth, is it at all? Well, why isn't this working in the church? Why isn't this working in our church? Why aren't we suddenly having more and more people here? We've been faithful, haven't we? Isn't that the command of God to be faithful? We have Christ-centered preaching. We have hymns that bring glory to God. We have worship services that, that lead people to forgiveness and lead people to the promise of salvation. We even have Bible studies throughout the week that encourage people to grow in their faith. So why isn't it working? We have the promise of God in Isaiah 55. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering, so, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will, will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Well, that sounds like a pretty sure promise, doesn't it? It sounds like a sure promise that if, that if you're faithful, that if you proclaim the word, that if you honor God, then he's going to bless it. Did you catch that right at the end? It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Well, isn't it God's desire for people to enter the church? Isn't it His desire for people to come to know Him? For the pews to be overflowing? Shouldn't every church, every congregation everywhere have more than enough people? Well, maybe, may, maybe that's the problem. May, maybe it's not that we weren't faithful, but maybe it's, it's, it's that, we, that we were too faithful. Maybe the problem is, is we're trying to preach a message that was given to us 2,000 years ago. Well, I mean, we live in a new day and age, don't we? So many things have changed in 2,000 years since Christ first gave the message. So maybe the problem is, is we're still trying to beat the same drum, tell the people the same thing. Maybe we need to go to the bookshelves and find out what the bestsellers are. Find out what those authors are saying. Maybe it'd be better if we look at the, at the current music trends. Find out what your friends are trending what kind of music they like. Or, or maybe we need to turn on the television and see what shows are grossing the most people. Have a good, loud opening bang. A more impactful message. Well, that doesn't seem very much in line with Scripture, does it? it, in, fact, it in fact, it almost seems to go exactly against what Christ said in Mark chapter 8. 
when he said, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his father, Father's glory with the holy angels. Strong words from Christ, aren't they? In fact, it sounds like this message that's 2,000 years old, that in fact he expects it to be applicable still today. That this message that he gave us in Scripture, he didn't intend for it to sit on the shelf and for us to dust it off once a month when we make it. No, instead, instead we see in Hebrews where the author of Hebrews writes, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. No, the message, the message hasn't changed. So what is it? We've remained faithful. We haven't changed the message. We've been doing what we're supposed to be doing. So what's wrong? Why isn't the church overwhelmed with people? Why aren't we bursting at the seams needing to add three, four, or five services? Why are, why are we seeing a decrease in membership, a decrease in offerings, instead of an increase? Perhaps, perhaps the problem isn't so much with growth. Perhaps the problem is with our, me our, use, our measuring tool. Perhaps we've tried, not just perhaps actually, as a, as a church, and as I mean that as a broad, around the world church, we've tried to fit into the, 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 the way businesses do things. We've tried to follow their methods, their ideas. The idea of a good business is to please the stockholders, raise the bottom lines, and bring up consumer confidence, to sell more, to sell more, to sell more. But is that God's measuring tool? Is that the way God measures growth? Does God just expect us to keep selling more, to have a comfortable bottom line, to see the church with the, all the warm seats and all the, every pew warmed up? I don't think that God falls into the business model and doesn't expect it in the church. In fact, when we try to, try to fit the church into this business model, we, we, we run into some problems, don't we? Because that call, that business model, and following God's standard would be 100%, wouldn't it? And even the churches that are growing right now, we have some churches in our community that are growing right now. But not one of them has a 100% growth rate, do they? In fact, if we looked at it, how many of them even have a 50% growth rate? When we start to put it into numer uh, earthly numerical numbers, the idea of growth into something we can control, something we can handle, we see that, it is, that we are fa a far cry. Not one of our churches has 100% saturation in our community. Not even 50%. We look at, a, at our community, and we know we live in a community that is outside of Christ. We know that there are people who are here on Sunday morning, people who go to worship throughout the week, but there are so many people who don't. There are so many people who are outside the church. And so when we try to fit the church into those standards, those business models, we see a, that we constantly fail. So let's go back to God's measuring tool. Let's look again at what, how he measures the growth of the church. Not so much by numbers, but by relationship, doesn't he? God does want to see people hearing about him. He wants to see people in the pews. He wants to hear people worshiping him. He even gave us a command. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Third commandment encouraging us to be in church. But he also has something else in mind. We are the people of God, who he has called. Part of growth is that relationship with him. God's measuring tool is not about numbers, but it is about our relationship, our spiritual growth with him. It's about our relationship and if how well we know him, how well he knows us. Well, we know he knows us perfectly. But how well do you know God? How well do you know Him? How much of your life is, is taken over by that relationship with Him? See, God says in 2 Corinthians through Paul, he, His intention is to be part of all of our lives. Not just a little bit, but all of it. For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live the, with them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. We are the people of God. We are the children of God who have been saved by the precious message of the gospel. We are the children of God 
who, God, who, who He has called through our baptism. We are the children of God. And it just doesn't mean it stops at our baptism. But each and every day is a relationship with God that we continue to grow in. Did you notice Paul's commendment of the people of Thessalonica? His commend, commendment of them was not because they had the most impactful worship service out there. He didn't commend them because of the fact that the music they sang was the most uplifting and that the people were, were falling on the floor in joy. He commended them because of the great faith, because of their great convic conviction in God. Just hear again what he said to them. Brothers, loved by God. In ESV, he says, beloved loved by God. More so than even the word. That he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power. With power. With the Holy Spirit and with the deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. With deep conviction, the people of Thessalonica received God. With deep conviction, they heard that gospel message. They knew that they were sinners. They knew that they had broken God's law. And they knew that their lives were in need of repair. And with deep conviction, they heard that gospel message that Paul preached to them. They heard the words of Christ preached through Paul. And with deep conviction, in the face of persecution, they heard His love and heard His welcome. See, growth is not about numbers, but it's about our heart relationship with God. Growth is not about how many, but it's about how often, how much we are with Him. Now God, God gives us many places to grow, even sometimes in terrible sermons. Sometimes He gives us in, in, in hymns that, that can't be sung, that seem like the words are, uh, we stumble over them, that we struggle to call music sometimes. Even, even, in, even in prayers that are so short, or Bible studies that, are, that seem to, to be more confusing than helpful. In those, God, God is working on our hearts. But outside of the church too. How many of you have seen God work on your hearts when you've talked to a friend and shared the love of Christ with them? How many of you have seen the love of God in your life just in your day-to-day -day work when you went to your job, when you just went out there and did what He had called you to do? See, God doesn't just grow our hearts in church, which I think this is one of the best places He does, but it's outside of the church as well. He works on our hearts even in the struggles of our lives. He works in our hearts even when we feel we're far from Him. He's, that's when He's working on us, when He's bringing us closer to Him, when He's building up in us that trust in Him. See, growth, guaranteed church growth, is led by God. It's led by His Holy Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit is the one who ignites that fire within inside of us. The Holy Spirit is the one who initiates that growth. And He started so long ago in many of your lives. Some of your lives was just a short time ago. But many of your lives, it was so long ago. In your baptism, already that growth was starting to begin. The Spirit planted that seed in your heart. The Spirit started you growing. And, and He keeps each day, He keeps renewing you with the holy waters as He calls you back to Him and says, I forgive you. He washes you again new and makes you clean and fresh. But not only that, but in the union that you have with the Lord in Holy Communion. As often as we eat of His body and drink of His blood, we proclaim that He is coming again. But that He is present with us. That He has taken a union with us. As the hymn goes, in mystic sweet communion. See, our Lord, our Lord, He is the one. His idea of growth is not outside of us, but it is inside of us. It is the work that He is doing. And sometimes we, we remember that, that, that old children's song. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together. The church is not a resting place. The church is not a... I thought you guys knew this one. I'm sorry. The church is not a steeple. The church is the people. See, God works in each of us. He works in those... Who we, don't, the, who we don't even realize. Preparing their hearts, preparing their lives long before we re even see it. And He invites us to take part in this. He invites us to join Him in planting those seeds in other people. 
Well, I said church growth is not just about numbers, but it is also about reaching out to those who are lost, those who are dying. See, we were dead at one time. We were lost at one time. We were broken, and our hearts were far from God. And He came to us. And He reached into our hearts in only the way God could, and He knit it back together. And He rebuilt it. And He invites us to take part in sharing in this joyful experience, in this beautiful experience. He invites us to take part in reaching out to those who are lost and dying, sharing that life-giving message. Did you catch that? There is power. Power in God. There is power in His Word. And so even when we don't feel we have the words, even when we feel we don't have the strength, there is power in what God has done. There is power in His, in His work. And many times before we even realize that He has already been working on that person's heart. He has already been stirring in their lives that necessity for Him. He's already been touching them and showing them how much they need Him. Guaranteed church growth. It's not three easy steps. It's not seven easy steps. It's not a thousand easy steps. It's one easy step. Trust in the Lord. Trust in God. Trust in Him. Over and over again, He has shown His mercy to generation after generation. He has shown His mercy to people after people. We oftentimes think that we are in the worst of times because we live in a culture that is so far from God. But we're not. Just look down the paths of history. And what's coming in the future probably isn't that much prettier. But time and again, God has shown His love for His people. Time and again, God has reached into the lives of His people and He has lifted them up. He has put the, a new heart in them that they may preach the Gospel, but not by power and might, but by His Spirit. By His Holy Spirit dwelling within each one of us. His Holy Spirit that is guiding us through Scriptures. His Holy Spirit that is lifting us up through praise. His Holy Spirit that is the encouragement of one person to another. Sometimes we think, that there has to be a special word, a silver bullet. That the right color or the right time for the service, the right name on the church building is somehow going to bring people in. But those aren't the things that save people, are they? Those aren't the things that heal a sinful heart, are they? The only thing that can heal the sinful heart is the beautiful message of Christ, I forgive you. I love you. Is Christ's words to us. That as He went to the cross, that as He died, He didn't have to, but He said, I love you. I love each one of you so much that I will go to the cross. I will die. I will give my life, but I will not stop there. I will defeat death. I will take over, and I will show my power. And I will give you a promise. A promise that was written on each of our hearts. And a promise that we have to share. I give you the promise that one day you will be with me. Where? In paradise, right? One day we will be with Him forever in paradise. And that is the message of hope. Even beyond a simple message of, of love as we understand it, even beyond a, a simple message of comfort, in that promise God gives us hope. And that is true hope. The hope that one day, one day we will see the great multitudes of the heavenly host who He has called as His own, the great multitude of the heavenly hosts, who He has made us part of to invite, to bring in. So even in the midst of a world that sees the declines in church membership, that sees people dying, sees the offering plates not, not as full as they once were, we have trust. We have trust and we have hope because we know the One who has defeated death. We know the one who is able to give us new life. And we know the one who is able to plant and make it grow. The front of your bulletin covers this morning. I don't know if you took a moment to read the verse there. It says 1 Corinthians 3. Who is it that makes us grow? We may plant the seed. We may water it. But it is the Spirit who makes us grow. And we look forward to those opportunities. And may God fill your hearts just as He filled the hearts of the Thessalonians. 
May He fill your hearts that you may see opportunities to share His love. That you may see the promise that He has. And that you may embrace it and see the joy that comes through sharing His Gospel. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank You that You have come into our world, that You have come into our lives, that You have changed that You have changed the the certain death that we had and given us new life. Help us each day, Lord, to celebrate this promise and help us to look forward to the opportunity of sharing Your love with others. Lord, there is a generation out there who is lost, a generation who is dying, and a generation who is separated from You. Help us to see beyond our fears, to see beyond those things that, that we're concerned about and instead see them with the love that You have. See them with the love that drove you to the cross, that led you to stay on the cross. Help us to see them with the need that they have for that promise. The promise that one day we will be united with you in heaven. United in perfection where we will see just how many hearts you have grown. How many lives you have cultivated. And the love that you pour out in such abundance. This we pray through Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. And may His peace be with you. Amen.